Today we're gonna to overclock this biscuit. For those looking for a high-end custom gaming experience, look no further than Falcon Northwest. Falcon Northwest has been building PCs made for gamers for over 30 years with a focus on a true high-end gaming experience. Custom cases available only through Falcon Northwest feature state-of-the-art testing and design to ensure that every component is performing at their best through thermal imaging and rigorous lab testing designed and overseen by the Falcon Northwest founder himself. With a complete lineup of systems ranging from small to large, every Falcon Northwest system includes a three-year warranty policy and a year of two-way overnight shipping coverage providing the ultimate peace of mind. To see all that Falcon Northwest has to offer, follow the sponsored link in the description below. So if you haven't watched our 4070 Ti Super Review, it lands exactly where you would expect. It's slower than a 4080, but faster than a 4070 uh, Ti. Now what makes it different is the fact that it's an AD103 chipset with just, uh, I think it's about 512 CUDA cores, maybe a little more disabled uh, versus the 4080. So because it's on the same core as the 4080, rather than like trying to overclock a 4070 Ti to catch a 4080, that'd be very difficult because it's a, it's a slower core altogether. I wanna see what happens when we take this triple fan cooler and uh, push it as far as we possibly can. So a couple prerequisites before this overclock. It is on the Performance BIOS. Um, I've downloaded the latest version of Afterburner and the latest Wickle driver from NVIDIA. So you see core voltage is grayed out. That's because we gotta go in here, enable unlock voltage control. I always wanted to restart it one more time and see if it'll give me the slider. Nope, it's not. Could potentially be locked out of this particular card. Um, but that's okay. In terms of power limit, we're given an extra 10% of power limit. Now that's kind of a big deal because of the fact, if you recall, um, the 4070 Ti Super um, being on the AD103 is a much more efficient um, power limit anyway. So in fact, I need to look that up to see because I don't remember exactly what the, the power limit and the TDP is on the 4070 Ti. I also keep saying 4070 Ti instead of 4070 Ti Super. Just know today I'm talking about the Super. 4070 Ti Super, I'm not used to saying Ti Super. So if I misspeak, just know that that's what I'm talking about. Anyway, it's 285 watt maximum. That's significantly lower than the 4080 though at 350 watts. So already this is at a, what, 65 watt disadvantage from a 4080. So it's gonna be very difficult to even try and match a 4080, even if we had a golden chip because it is gimped on purpose, power limit wise, uh, from even reaching a 4080. So if we look at getting 10% additional power limit, now it's 10% additional from what the tough is. I'm not entirely sure what the tough's baseline is. It could have been a little higher. It could have been, I, I doubt it's higher because it's an MSRP card. It was also very controlled by Nvidia at launch. I bet you that's a 285 watt card, to be honest. But there's one way we can test that. So. Close any browsers you have open, close any background tasks, any sort of defender going, because believe it or not, these are all things that can um, reduce your score by a significant amount. So go in here and make sure you close, right? Turn off real-time protection, that's important. That can actually lead to a few percent of improvement for both CPU and GPU. But I'm gonna put this all back to factory right now, and I'm just gonna run, um, Port Royal. Now I like to use Port Royal for initial overclocking because we need to stress the RT cores. If you only test a title that doesn't use RT and it only does rasterization, you'll find you can get some pretty heavy clocks and you'll get some really good scores. But then as soon as you run a title that uses the tensor cores or the RT cores in any way, you'll find that the, uh, the performance is probably more um, unstable. So I, you have to, if you're doing an RT card and you're going for max clocks with anything involving RT, you've got to do an RT test. So that's why we don't use heaven or whatever when it comes to trying to determine overclocking stability. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to go ahead and load up Port Royal. So you can use either Port Royal or even Speedway, which is their newer test for this. I just am really accustomed to Port Royal because I've seen that test thousands of times with all the overclocking that we've done. Now you'll notice the clock, the card is currently at 43C while just sitting here idle. That's because we are at 0% fan speed. That is both in the performance and the quiet BIOS on the tough card. They are zero RPM uh, fans when not under load. So one of the things I like to do is also go in here to fan, enable just the default fan curve it puts in there, which puts the minimum fan at 40% and hit apply. I like to do that because in between tests, I don't want the card to be too hot. I wanna keep it as cool as possible. In fact, when we start our overclocking, I'll be putting those fans pretty close to 100%, but maybe not all the way up there because this card is so efficient versus the cooler that's on there. We don't actually need the amount of cooler that's on this card. It's, it's pretty massive for a 285 watts, but because it's basically the same PCB layout as a 4080, I think a lot of these brands just stuck 4080 coolers on the 4080 Supers and 4070 Ti's. Um, 
It makes sense that they would do that, right? Why change up the PCB layout if it's just a cut down version of a 4080? Okay, so our power with stock right now, as you can see, is not, so this is something you gotta keep in mind. A lot of people think like, oh, if it's 285 watt card under load, it should always hit 285 watts, but that's not true. There's there's max wattage and then there's like the actual game used wattage. So in games, most of the time, even though the card is gonna show us like GPU usage 100%, as you can see right there, there's 252 watts, 267, 282, 282, 277, 276. We still have a couple of watts on the table, but obviously when we get that 10% additional, it's gonna give us what, 22 watts additional, right? So I just wanted to see what our max temps are gonna be currently. Our power limit though, as you can see, is our number one reason for being limited right here. Power limit is almost always at one. The only time it's not at one is when it reduces the voltage momentarily, even though the clock speeds, as you can see, are barely locked right here at the 2700s. They go anywhere from like 2775 all the way down as low as like, 2685 right there. So I think we have a lot of room for improvement, especially considering our temperatures right now. We're only at 56 C, 57, 55. So the very first thing I'm gonna do right here is while it's running, I'm gonna go ahead and just maximize our power limit and our temp limit and just hit apply. And I wanna see what's gonna happen to our um, power wattage right here. Boom, max that out. So 302, 304 instantly, and still power limited. That's because we know that the 8103 can go all the way up to 350 watts. We know that. So that means that what's really holding back this card is power limit, which means any of the beefier, higher overclocking built cards that have power limits that might go up as high as like 320. I think I said, yeah, it's 350 for the 380 or the 4080. So if they go up to like 320, then we might be able to get kind of close to a base 3080 uh, with overclocking. Now, the reason why I'm even talking about that is we're comparing it to a card that used to cost $1,200 plus and this card costs $800. So that is $400 cheaper. And although not a cheap card, $400 cheaper is enough to pay for your whole CPU. So if you can get near a 4080 uh, and save 400 bucks, that's a big deal. Our frequency is now locked at 2760, not moving at all. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and bump up the fan speed to about 80%. The reason I don't want the fans to go too high is because of the fact that the fans, although it's only a few watts, maybe five watts total for all three fans, are part of that total board power that's available included in that 285 watts. So we wanna make sure that we keep the card as cool as possible so that temperature doesn't start bending us down into lower frequencies, but not so cold that we're not gaining anything by being that cold, but we're losing power available to the GPU. So that's the balance and trade-off that you gotta do right here. So you can see I'm still at 2760. The temperatures have started to trend downward as you can see right there. Well, as you can see right here, our power limit now is sitting mostly at zero. So that's good. That means we can start kind of pushing up the clock a little bit. Cause look, our voltage is now our limit. This is why I was hoping that maybe I could have given us a, a little bit of additional voltage slider. The reason why I bring that up is the RTX 4080 and 4090 will show 11 or 1050 voltage or 1050 millivolts versus the 1100 that's available to it. And a lot of times, unless you move that slider, it won't go to 1100, it stays at 1050. That 50 millivolts is huge. Unfortunately, this card uh, with the latest version of MSI Afterburner is not allowing us to be able to push it up. So let's start bumping our clock up by 50 offset at one time. So there we go, hit apply. There's 2805, going to 100. Now what I'm testing is just to see what kind of um, core lottery I've got here. Before even touching memory, I wanna see how far can I push the core in something like Port Royal before we get a crash or any artifacting. So it's 2850. And I tend to go 50 megahertz at a time. It, it says 50 megahertz, it's not gonna be 50 every time. It's 15 megahertz increments, which obviously is not divisible. 15, or 50 is not divisible by 15 evenly. So that's why they tend to sometimes jump um, or not move at all. So there's 150, that gets us 2895. It did hit 2910, there it is right there. But you can see our power limit is now a factor again. Now here's why we don't want power limit to be something we're bumped up against all the time and keep pushing the frequency because in between tests or if the load drops suddenly and then the frequency shoots past its stable point, then you'll get crashes. So think of it as like tug of war, right? So if you're pulling real hard and someone's pulling on the other end, what happens if you just let go, right? They go flying, they go falling down. So if you were to just like gently release that, that rope, the other team would start feeling that and 
adjust and not go flying backwards. So the same thing sort of happens here. If you have a really high frequency set, but it can't hit that frequency because of the load and power limit keeping it from going there, if it switches scenes or you're in a game where suddenly you go into an area that's not quite as demanding, say you went from outdoors to indoors, suddenly that uh, what's happening is that load is let go with the rope and your frequency shoots up to where it's unstable and you thought it was stable because it never was touching that frequency while you were running those tests. So anyway, there we go. I'm gonna go 200 now. What I'll do if I start to hit instability is I will then start to go 25 at a time, all the way down to even five at a time until I figure out exactly what that frequency is, number is that it's crashing at. Now we went from 2910 to 2055 by adding 50. So obviously I gained 45, no, yeah, 45, and I didn't gain the 50 I put. So that tells me I'm now either right in between that bidding number of where 50 is not divisible by 15, or I'm potentially hitting where the um, power limit's not letting it go as high as the frequency is trying. So now I have to be careful because of the fact that we could easily end up in an area where um, we're no longer gonna be stable if that happens. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna let this test since it's at the end finish real quick, and then I wanna see what happens when it restarts and it goes to a black screen. Okay, so when it went black for a second and started back up, it wasn't a problem. So I'm gonna do 2025 or 225. For most, for the most part, 3000 megahertz tends to be where, see I just, there's the crash. See I just gave it 25 additional megahertz requested and it crashed and it never adjusted the frequency. It never went above that 2955. And it's a full system crash. This isn't a problem because what will tend to happen is this, actually the driver recovered. Now at this point, we can't trust anything that happens from here on out on a recovered driver. The best practice is going to be to restart the system entirely. So let's do that. I mean, look at that right there, right? There's, there's an example of st stuff that starts to happen. So this is why we always restart after a crash, even if the driver recovers. Now what I'm gonna do after it restarts is I'm gonna go to 20 or 210 instead of 225. Okay, so what I've done this time is I started the test with the fans already at 80%. So that's probably a best practice that's not good is starting the card with the low fan percent and then trying to pull the temp down throughout the test. Starting the, the test with the card as cold as possible will usually lead the best temps because pulling temps back down is harder than even at the same uh, percentage of fan speed than allowing it to find its max temp if that fan speed starts prior to the load. We're at 29.55, so I wanna see now, if I do 210, will it go up or will it crash? Okay, so there's 29.70. So you can see right now the extra 25, I know I'm gonna crash in the next 15 megahertz. Now, that means we're gonna be getting pretty close to um, our, our stable limit right here. And I wanna see if we can even hit 3,000. I don't think it's gonna happen because I need 30 more megahertz and I don't have 30 more megahertz available in there before it crashes. So I'm gonna try 215, see if I can't get one more boost pin out of it. Nope, it's not going up at all. So I, I think for the sake of stability, I'm gonna go back to 205, just stay right there. That's 2940 to 2955. I was hoping to hit 3000 megahertz with this, but I don't think it's gonna be possible without having at least 320 watts available to us. I think we're having a voltage slash wattage limit here, not a core um, quality thing. Now what we need to do is now that we know 205 is where our max is for the for the uh, GPU, we need to figure out where our memory is going to crash. Because believe it or not, you'll more often gain more frames per second improvement by overclocking your memory than you will by overclocking your core to its limit. So sometimes if I were to go instead of two, 205 on the core, if I went like 150 on the core, but then push my memory up to like plus 1000, which is actually very possible on both the Samsung and Hynix GDDR, uh, GDDR6X, you'll get more improvement doing that than you will core clock most of the time. All right, so I'm gonna go right for it. I'm gonna go 500 immediately. What we're looking for here with memory overclocks is we are looking for any sort of artifacting. Uh, this is ECC memory. The GDDR6X is ECC, but we leave ECC off. I bet you it can go 1000, honestly. I've yet to find a card that couldn't go 1,000. There it is right there. All right, 1,500. Now can it do it with plus 200 on the core? That's the question. Yes, but keep in mind, you notice the clocks are lower. A lot of times what you're gonna notice is as you overclock the RAM, that needs power too. We have a total board power that we have to stay within. So it's gonna have to start dividing up the power limitations there. So, so far that seems to be pretty stable-ish. 
I saw a flicker right there for a second when it changed scenes, which could be indicative of the memory, because as the memory, as we overclock the memory, it's gonna start getting hotter too. Now these good coolers definitely touch the memory RAM chips, or the, the memory chips most of the time. Sometimes you find they reuse a cooler that doesn't touch them and that's bad. Um, keeping the, the memory cool is also very important. So they also have a maximum operating temperature. I'm not entirely comfortable with that flicker that I saw. It was only for a moment and it was in between a seam and I'm gonna go 1400. So far, this seems to be pretty stable. So what I wanna see now is how close can this card get to a stock 4080? Now, yes, you can do the same thing to a 4080 and jump that much farther ahead, but it's still gonna cost you 400 plus dollars more. All right, so synthetics mean nothing. We need to see what actual real FPS in the game is. So I chose Forza only because it, it tends to be able to go higher FPS. And I'm, I'm curious as to what our numbers were before, but we're running these tests back to back. Obviously there's gonna be variance from run to run. So uh, anyway, I need to go into the settings here. We're gonna do this at 1440p. I think that's um, realistically where someone with this card would land. Although our test did show that a 4070 Ti is super tough did go up to like 118 FPS in 4K. So you'd be able to play 4K in this particular title. But I'm gonna do 1440p. I think that'd be a more realistic pairing. Okay, so we had a uh, 160, hey, 162. Okay, not bad. Um, that's within margin of error. If you, you can run the test five times and get it to fluctuate one or two FPS every single time. Okay, so what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna go ahead and just go right to my MSI Afterburner. I'm going to apply that right there. And you know, the hottest it got was 59C. It was still climbing a little bit, but that shows the efficiency of the cooler. But anyway, I'm gonna let this cool itself down a little bit right now. It's coming down quick too. It's a 55, 54, 52. I'm gonna run that test one more time and we'll see where we come up from on uh, the 162 right there. So we came up to 170 FPS, eight FPS improvement. So although you would still have a very hard time determining the difference between 160, 162 to 170, you can still see there's a, there is an improvement to be had there. Now, if you're doing the math on that, it probably came up about the same percentage that we increased our clock speeds. It just tends to be the way it works. So that's the way that we go about overclocking the graphics cards. It's not a lot of room these days. Uh, back in the day when we would have like thousand megahertz, maybe 1100 megahertz on the graphics cards. We could overclock them to like 1500 megahertz, 1600 megahertz. You saw huge improvements because that's like 40%, right? So we're only getting single digit improvement in clock speed in terms of percentages, which means it's not going to translate to the biggest improvement on the, uh, the FPS there. So if we compare that though to a 4080, our 4080 run got a, our FE was a 135. Oh, so that's 4K, sorry. 174 FPS in 1440. So four FPS difference. So I think one of the major takeaways here is that the 4070 Ti Super might go down in history over time as one of the like sweet spot cards because it's so much cheaper than the 4080 launched at. That was 1200 bucks, which we know was a scam at that point, like 1200 bucks for 4080. If they can manufacture this card for 800 bucks with the same die as the 4080, which was 1200, there's the scam, right? I, it, I don't know how else to call it, but I can tell you right now being this close to a 4080 and $400 cheaper, I think this card is going to go down as history, in history as a, as a good, very, very high performing card for the money. It's not cheap, but it's a good performing card for the money. The 1070 and 1070 Ti were also very popular, very sought after cards. This over time, we'll just have to wait and see um, how that pans out. But I know the 3060 has gained a ton of popularity in the Steam survey. So it'd be interesting to see how this card does over time. So I think real, realistically, the 4070 Ti, um, it's like, screw the 4080. But you know what? It doesn't even matter because you can't even buy the 4080 anymore. Well, you can, but when they're gone, you won't be able to buy them anymore because the 4080 Super is sliding in at a cheaper price point. Anyway, there you go, guys. Just a little quick guide on how to overclock a 40 series card and the types of tangible improvements we can get. They're there, but they're hard to discern if you're running it in a game that gets super high resolution or a high FPS anyway. So there you go. I hate that they're becoming less and less necessary to overclock because I find that to be fun. But uh, when the cards are already going 2770 megahertz and we can overclock it to 2955, that's not a huge improvement. That's like getting 400 extra RPM out of your car. It's not gonna make a huge difference at the end of the day. So whatever, there you go guys. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.